Hi. Uh, this I'm recording this video to go over um, your first section test uh, for Phil 1300. Um, due Monday, October 9th uh, at 12 noon. I'm posting it early because I figured you would enjoy a little bit of extra time to work through these kinds of questions. Uh, plus, I was on top of things this week, so um, that's good anyway. Um, so uh, I'm hoping these uh, these section tests are going to be fairly straightforward, except with regard to the complication of the material. Um, and uh, this video is intended to kind of shepherd you through um, not only the, the policies pertaining to the test, the material for the test, the questions for the test, but also more generally strategies for how to respond to these kinds of questions. Um, sort of trying to answer questions uh, before you even have them, right? Um, it, in these videos, I tend to give you too much. Um, so uh, these videos will likely be an asset for you with regard to how to go about answering these questions. Uh, there are two texts um, that uh, we've so far engaged with that um, pertain to these tests. Uh, the first is Plato's Five Dialogues, the Socrates material, the Apology and the Credo. And the second is Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, um, of which you're responsible for books one, books two, and book um, number three, section one. And that's as far as we're going there. Um, so um, it, basically this should be really straightforward. Uh, three Socrates questions, um, three Aristotle questions. Um, uh, the questions are weighted at five points each for a total of 30 points, and you see from the course syllabus the way um, that that fits into your grade. And um, the first thing you'll find um, on the test is a bunch of boilerplate from the course syllabus. Um, uh, the description of the, um, the, the, the section tests, um, it, like I say, it's a short answer, five points each for a total of 30 points. Um, everything that we've engaged with with this class, the video material, the textual readings, that sort of thing, fair game for this test. Um, that's what I've expected that you will read. Um, I actually list the readings in the video material um, uh, down as part of what you're responsible for for the test. Um, it, these are not timed tests. Um, you will have from today when I post it um, all the way up. Uh, to noon on the 9th um, with the questions, with your books, with the video material, with the internet, with each other through the forums and whatnot, um, that sort of thing. And they're designed to mimic kind of the way that academics tend to work. Um, like when I work on a paper, I bring all of the resources that I've got to bear on that paper. All right. So, um, effectively, uh, what I'm doing is mimicking uh, that, that standard. Um, so, uh, with regard to policies, I've got in bold here that no late assignments will be accepted. There's a caveat to that, the missed assignment policy. Uh, basically, the idea is that if it looks like you're not going to um, be able to get this assignment in on time, uh, then you should contact me, preferably before the deadline or due date, um, or within 12 hours of uh, the deadline and the due date. The, the idea is that um, an extension requires a conversation. Uh, we need to have a conversation about whether or not I'm going to accept. So, but you'll you'll find I'm pretty easygoing, and I'm trying to lay out everything so that you succeed in this course. So I'm not going to cut you off at the knees or anything. So, um, it, that policy is there because I've had problems in the past. Um, with regard to ass assignment submission, you will be uploading a single file. Um, it, so, it, like, you open your Word document or whatever, it, you type away all of your responses. What I would do is break this down into, like, maybe answer a question a day um, until it's due. Um, save yourself plenty of time to proofread, that sort of thing. Get an early start on this. Um, because you'll find these questions are a little bit involved and are going to require a bit of thought, reflection, and writing, maybe going back over your notes or what have you. Um, so um, assignment submission, uh, there are a few issues with that. Um, first off, 
uh, make sure you give yourself plenty of time before the due date um, to submit your file. And just, just make sure that you've got plenty of time um, because it, like, at, after a cutoff date, um, you won't be able to submit through the portal. And then I'll have to go looking for it. And maybe you wound up in a spam folder or something along those lines. So and anyhow, um, it, give yourself plenty of time to get it in on time. Right? Um, it, because I've given you plenty of time with this assignment, that should be good and possible. Secondly, um, make sure you're uploading the correct file, um, it, like the correct and complete file, a draft where you've answered questions one, two, three, and half of question number four. I can only grade what I've got, right? So um, make sure you get me the correct file, not your draft file, the final file, uh, and give it a proofread before you submit it, right? Just, just because one of the goals that is clarity in writing and proofreading is key to that, right? Um, then finally, make sure you submit the actual file. Um, it, I say this only because I've had somebody's English homework or COM homework and that sort of thing. And well, you know, your 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 analysis of of Faulkner is interesting. It's not a response to Socrates and Aristotle questions for your ethics course. So make sure you get me the right file. Right. All of this is just to say that it's I. I will give this a lot of attention and you'll see um, when I respond you'll have lots of comments that suggest ways to improve and that sort of thing. I mean them to be therapeutic and um, basically they're geared so that you will succeed in this course. Um, it, I will spend a lot of time with your submission. You have to get it to me. All right? That's your responsibility. And so I can, I can only grade what I get. Um, and if you're worried about um, submitting to Moodle um, redundantly, send me an email. Email it to me as well. Then that way you've got a backup and you know it's there. All right. So um, I suppose that's all I want to say about assignment submission. It's your responsibility to get it to me, make sure it's complete, make sure it's correct, make sure it's yours on top of that, which brings me to the last note. Um, just like academics working, we're going to bring all of the resources we've got to bear, um, it, whether it's uh, books, uh, whether it's internet resources, whether it's interviews, whether it's, um, it's something we've heard in a news article, that sort of thing, uh, whether it's a conversation with a, a colleague or something along those lines, we're going to bring all of the resources to bear on creating the best academic output that we can. But it's also our responsibility to make sure the arguments and the analysis are ours. Right? Um, with all of these resources, I know it might be tempting to just grab an explanation from somewhere else, a clear distinction between what is yours and what comes from somewhere else should it should be, should, should be, it, well, you're required to, to do that, right? So if you're using textual material um, it, it beyond your own reflections, provide reference that guides the reader to the source of your material, right? Um, it, it, with all of the song and dance I've already given you about plagiarism, um, it, it, this should be obvious, but nonetheless, it needs to be here on the, um, the test page. If you're Another note about textual material external to the course. I mean, if you're using that sort of thing and quoting it, you're, every, everything you quote should be evidence for your own claims, right? So if you're quoting something, you then have to unpack the quote, right? Because what I'm grading these assignments on is your understanding of this material. Right. So if I get a block quote from um, it, 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 Wikipedia or something along those lines, right, or from um, it, it, some commenter or something, right, then I I don't know what you've understood of this material. That's my goal to to. So you know, if you're using it a quotation from something that you've used to help you understand this material, that's great. But then show me how it's helped you to understand this material because it's your understanding that I need to see there. 
So um, it, it, I'm going to enforce all of these policies. And um, if you're nervous about plagiarism on the course syllabus, I've given you a link to CiteBright. Um, it's in one of the footnotes uh, attached to the plagiarism policy on the, um, the course syllabus. Uh, go through that. It takes an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours, that sort of thing. Um, and it's a really good program. And so it'll tell you when you have to reference and how to reference properly and that sort of thing, right? So um, it, it, now the final question with regard to re referencing is what style do you want? MLA, APA, Chicago, Jimmy Crack Corn? I don't care, right? The thing is, um, it, with regard to a hundred level course like this is, or a thousand level course, I guess now it's it's 1300 kind of thing. It's a first year course anyway. I care that you reference. Your discipline will eventually require a specific reference form from you, like whether it's APA, MLA, Chicago, does, you know, it's going to be specific to your discipline. I. I care that you reference, I don't care how you reference. The, the idea is if someone wants to go looking for it, they should be able to find it. Right. So, so that's the principle we're operating on. Um, so these are short answer questions. Um, they require a minimum of two paragraphs in response to them. Right. So um, uh, you might think that that is long, but nonetheless, um, this is shorter. I'm not asking you to write a five-page paper. Uh, so um, a paragraph, just just so we define things, is a minimum of three sentences. Right. Um, it, but that said, like, if, if you've got two sentences, you don't have a paragraph. Right. And it, that said, um, it, your responses should be substantial and probably will exceed this minimum because of the nature of the questions that I'm asking you. Uh, the nature of the questions is I usually ask you to do two, three things with regard to this material. So um, there are a total of six of these questions and uh, really what I want to see is um, your ability to reason through, make distinctions, um, to follow arguments, to do some analysis, that sort of thing. Um, so it, you need to give it to me in order to um, it, demonstrate that you understand this material. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking for you to demonstrate your understanding of this material. Uh, so I'm not being a jerk with these questions. Um, if one, it's supposed to be writing intensive course, so this is what it's got to be. And two, um, with regard to this, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you these questions and asking you to do this work because I think you can do it. Right? So um, I'm trying to give you plenty of time and lay everything out so that, again, you can succeed. Um, with regard to sentences, I mean full sentences. If you give me point form, I have to interpret and you're not effectively and clearly communicating about ideas as required by the cross-cutting capacities of a, a, a gen ed course. Right. So um, that it, yeah, I need full sentences um, in terms of a response to these questions. So that um, is all of the policy stuff. Um, with regard to each of these questions, given, given their nature, um, what I would do is break down each of these questions into their various parts and make sure you're answering them completely. Right? Um, I find with regard to the first test, if students are losing grades, it's generally because they answered the first part of the question but didn't engage with the second part of the question. Break it down and make sure you're answering it completely. Um, take the time to do so. So, um, first three questions on Socrates, um, uh, two on the Apollo, no, two on the Credo, and one on the Apology. Um, uh, the big one from the Apology has to do with that movement from epistemology to ethics. I had to write a forum uh, response on this, so you should have plenty of background. Um, with regard to this uh, question, read Socrates presents us with a an epistemological theory of knowledge position in which we are only able to make a negative claim of knowledge. However, Socrates is able to make positive moral claims that stem from this negative claim to knowledge. 
discuss the intellectual movement from epistemology to ethics that makes this possible. Now, again, strategizing. If I were going to answer this question, right, um, it, I'd ask myself, well, what's Socrates' epistemology? Well, that starts with asking why it said that he's the wisest man in Athens. I might follow that argument, right? So that's part one. This is his epistemology. To think you're wise when in fact you're not um, is an epistemological no-no. And it turns out that this is also an ethical no-no. Right? So if human wisdom is worth little or nothing, as it says on page 27, let me double check. Yeah, 27, right? What's probable, gentlemen, is the fact that the god is wise and his auricular response meant that human wisdom is worth little or nothing and that when he says this man Socrates, he's using my name as an example as if he said this man among you mortals is wise as who, like Socrates, understands that his wisdom is worthless. And there's your cent central quote with regard to epistemology. Well, if this epistemological claim applies to each and every one of us, well, what sort of ethical dispositions and what sort of ethical activities, actions, that is, does this suggest or require? If I know nothing, should I claim to know things? If I and you and all of us know nothing, then should we act as though we do? Well, what's then required of us, right? Well, he stresses a form of moral reasoning, doesn't he? You see, this is, this is, this is where I say I give you too much on these videos, right? So I just gave you a structure for answering question number one. I'll probably accidentally do so for the rest of them, too. So um, you should have plenty on um, that. Question number two related to the credo. Socrates and Credo, at the start of uh, their deliberation regarding Socrates' escape from prison, um, uh, do, 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 Socrates, that, that's awkward. Socrates, at the start of their deliberation from, regarding Socrates' escape from prison, I will add at this, that Socrates and Credo hold distinct theories of justice that are so incompatible that Socrates argues, quote, there is no common ground between those who hold this view and those who do not, but inev inevitably they despise each other's view. Offer a brief account of each theory. I went over this on the video, right? Uh, early on in Crato's argument for why Socrates should escape, right? besides, I don't think what you're doing is just Socrates, his position becomes quite clear, and I detailed it in the video, right? And then Socrates offers right around where um, it's, I quoted on page 52 there, his own theory of justice, right? So basically what I want you to do is break down both theories of justice, offer analysis or commentary if you like, but with regard to this question, basically theory of justice one, theory of justice two is all I'm looking for. It's a fairly straightforward kind of thing. And right? it's basically, I want you to know that they are distinct. Right. And Socrates' theory of justice flows into uh, the next question. Right. So this is establishing a basis for the next question. That makes sense. Right. So um, that should be pretty straightforward. Go back to my video, check that out, and um, away we go. Question number three. In his fictional conversation with the laws of Athens, Socrates introduces the distinct uh, but related notions of the social contract and tacit consent. Briefly outline this argument. That's your first thing. Follow Socrates' arguments. What are you planning to do, Socrates? Are you not trying to destroy us, say, the laws of Athens? Well, what do they argue? As part of that argument, they introduce the notions of the social uh, contract and tacit consent. What was the agreement between us, Socrates? Right? And didn't you sit on your butt in Athens for all this time, etc., etc.? So, anyhow, as it, you know, outlining this argument introduces the distinct but related notions of the social contract and tacit consent. This should come through explicitly 
in your response. I want to say, you to say something like Socrates introduces with this conversation the idea of a formal agreement between citizen and state. I just gave it to you, didn't I? Uh, anyhow, um, you, you get the idea. I want it to come out explicitly. Right? And then following that, by your analysis of this argument, what sort of duties are implicit to democratic citizenship, because this social contract rests on Athenian democracy, on, on the basis of the Athenian democracy, one of the options that the laws of Athens gives. I mean, you can get out, you can obey, or you can persuade the laws to do better, right? So, um, effectively, the way I see these two dialogues and the apology is making an argument for why his sort of activity should be allowed within the context of the city-state of Athens. That was the point of the gadfly argument. Look, I'm doing something both democratic and beneficial to Athenians. Right? And what's more, right, it stems from the expression of our distinctive human capacities. For the unexamined life is not worth living, and it's the greatest good to discuss these things every day. Right? So, that's the argument in the apology. There, if, if democracy is going to achieve its own ends, then this sort of activity needs to take place. So, that suggests some protective rights, doesn't it? Whereas, in the Credo, the dilemma imposed by the social contract and tacit consent actually show up a shortcoming or a failing of Socrates, who says that in his long life, he's never actually argued in front of the courts. Well, what sort of disposition to the laws of a city-state should we have as a duty if we're going to be subject to them and everybody is going to be subject to them in this way? If we think a law is unjust, are we completely hands-free? Are we... You know, it, like, it, it, do we have no responsibility for demanding that the laws are just, or might we have, uh, anyhow, right? You see where I'm going with this. Five points for that one, and that is Socrates. Question four, five, and six are Aristotle questions. Now, the function argument for Aristotle, and remember, it, I went through this argument in book one of the Nicomachean Ethics fairly extensively, is the linchpin of Aristotelian ethics. Right? Um, in the Nicomachean Ethics, it's how Aristotle is able to claim any of the other things about responsibility for character, developing character, and it, it defining virtue, that sort of thing that he's able to. So it's important that we briefly discuss the function argument discussed by Aristotle in Nick, Book 1 of the Nicomachean Ethics. So introduce the argument. All right. Introducing this argument, discuss how Aristotle arrives at his definition of happiness by way of this argument. All right. So two parts. Give me the function argument. How does Aristotle arrive at his definition of happiness? Oh, and by the way, offer Aristotle's definition of happiness as part of that second discussion, right? Far too often I've read, oh, this is the function argument, look how it works, and he arrives at his definition of happiness by way of this argument. But you don't introduce the definition of happiness, it should be in there, right? So, um, five points for that one should be fairly straightforward. Um, go back to my videos and um, it, it, I discuss it in the first of them. Right. Okay, question number five. You see how this works? Question on book one, question on book two, and then a question on book three, section one. Right. Um, question number five is the book two question. In book two, section four of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle argues that virtuous actions themselves are not sufficient to develop a virtuous character. Remember, Aristotle, by way of the function argument, turns, it's awkward, but being human, humaning into a task, right, and one that we evaluate in terms of 
how well we're able to perform our function, that is, how well we have developed the skills and dispositions necessary for virtue, right? So how do we develop a virtuous character? By acting virtuously, practice the same way we get to Carnegie Hall. So um, I think I just gave you a part of it. Uh, this 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 argument. So um, more or less, he's turned it into a skill. Right? But here, Aristotle argues that actions themselves are not enough to develop a virtuous character. Here, Aristotle adds three requirements, insisting that quote the agent must also be in the right state when he does them. Aristotle twenty two. Now you see what I've done. I've given you book two, section four, and I've given you a page reference. Uh, this is where you should be looking for this argument. Um, define state discussed by Aristotle in section 5 of book 2. You remember he just said, but the action must be in the right state when he does them. And offer a brief account of virtue of character. Right. So I would reverse that if I were answering it. Virtue, uh, virtue of character is a habitual disposition, blah, 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 yakety schmackety, right? Now, effectively, what Aristotle means is that we are responsible for these states as distinct from feelings and capacities, right? Part two of the question. Briefly discuss these three requirements introduced in section four of book two by Aristotle. All right, one, two, three, and um, my video goes through them in very, very explicit, specific terms. So, um, it, you know, there's the structure. It, basically, this is the overview question of book two. I want to see that you know what's going on in terms of virtue of character or moral virtue, which is the main sub subject of book two of the Nick and McCann Ethics. Straightforward? I think so. All right. Okay, final question. In paragraph 13 of book 3, section 1 of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle identifies two classes of action that uh, potentially can be regarded as involuntary. Remember in my video I said that annoyingly Aristotle defines responsibilities for the voluntary. What's involuntary is, annoyingly he defines um, the voluntary by what it's not. I hate when people do that, but nonetheless, Aristotle does. There are only two specific and narrow cases of actions that are even potentially considered involuntary. Um, what I want you to do is to briefly introduce each. It should be straightforward. Aristotle then draws a distinction between what he calls non-voluntary, uh-oh, new term, and what he would call properly inv uh, involuntary. How are these types of action distinct? And oh, why does Aristotle bother to make this distinction? At this point, like I did in the video, I'm going to point out that your copy of the Nicomachean Ethics comes with this excellent series of um, explanatory notes at the back. Right? So if you go to the back, you're in book three, Chapter 1, oh, here's paragraph 13 on page 203, it's for someone's dot 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 no pain. The distinction between the non-voluntary and the involuntary is dot dot dot. This is an excellent uh, resource for your understanding this distinction. Right. Use of examples is good um, as well. Examples show me you know what the heck you're talking about, so that's, that's a good way to go about it. And um, that's your test. Hopefully it should be pretty straightforward. You've got lots of time to concentrate on it. If you have questions, please let me know, um, and I will do my best to answer them. I have office hours um, on Thursdays um, from 4.30 to 5.30. Please come by if um, you're nervous at all about this. And um, I really do look forward to reading your responses. I find it fascinating what people are um, taking of this material. And um, it's, I'm always interested in getting into either in writing or in person a discussion about philosophy and ethics. So um, let me know if you need anything and uh, we will go from there. All right.
Thank you. Have good days, one for each of you.